on the agenda, which is 691. Declarations of any disclosable pecuniary interest. Are there any, please? Nope. Okay, 692. Apologies for absence. Are there any, please? Yes, from Councillor McDonald. Right, thank you. 693. The minutes. We're asked to confirm the minutes of the 20th of December. Um, I'll just check the pages for you. Uh, any, any changes, comments about page one? Page two? Page three? And hopefully not page four. <laughs> okay. Can I sign this, colleagues, as being a true record? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt, for replying. Yes. <laughs> and for those who did so, so gently as it's here. Yeah, it's on, it's on it, yeah. members, so. 694. I did say to um, our guest this evening that I'd push in item 700 a bit early. So if all of you will forgive me, can we go on to item 700 next? And then uh, we'll come back, obviously. So this is um, the Honoured Citizens Award. It's really a report on what happened this time. And if, if anyone wants to take it a bit further, you're welcome to do so. And I think um, I'll invite, I think I'll invite to say something first, and then uh, Mark Robinson might like to comment as well. But um, we do have a lot of bits of paper today, so. Okay. Here um, we go. <clears throat> okay, so we, uh, we have struggled uh, over recent months to try and firstly get nominations for our Honoured Citizens Award for 2023 and also find uh, a suitable um, event venue to um, to award it. And what we decided at um, the last committee is firstly, we did have some nominations. Uh, the committee nominated a group of three councillors, which was Councillor Terry, Councillor McDonald and Councillor Barreto to view and assess those nominations and come up with a recipient. And they uh, made the decision to award it to Karen Connor. Um, as a committee and council, we approached um, Mark, who was the organiser of the TARAS, to say that could we, as we support the TARAS and have done since its inception, um, use the TARAS <coughs> event to present that award. Uh, we did tweak and actually, the committee did say that they weren't very keen on the Honoured Citizens Board. It was, seemed to be an outdated terminology. So we actually uh, used Service in the Community Award at the TARAS on the 3rd of February this year, uh, and that award was presented. So as far as I'm concerned, we've achieved and successfully delivered what we said as a committee. Um, and I know some of you were there. I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that or are you going to Mark to? Mark, would you like to say anything at this stage? Yeah, no, Carol, that's it. Yeah, but first of all, I, I appreciate the collaboration, not just with the, 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 the award itself, but the actual event itself, particularly with the venues and the events thing. Um, the first thing I've done actually was went away and started working on the next event next morning. Uh, and it's only fair to let you know that I, I've revamped in the format completely in a way it's been to, to actually to enable the people to support the event, the events team and the caterers to deliver a more a smoother event. So that is, that's changing. But the reason I particularly, you know, fortuitously I bumped into the chairman today we had a coffee is, is how we move forward. I think I probably, on average, 150 plus nominations each time we run the event. And I think it, for me, you know, the next event is going to be in 2025. So that if you're willing to, win, to continue the collaboration, how we formalise a process for you to deliver your award within that, the, the evening itself. So there's a structure because it was all a bit last minute, 11th hour. And so for, for me, going forward is the event organiser at some point over the course of the next year because I, I'll, I'll be working on next year's event this year is how we, we get a process going forward to so enable you when for instance I'll be quite happy for you to access those nominations which we should give you a broader um, range of our community 
in which to select your own. And I'm referring to the old phrase, the honor of the citizen. That's about it for me, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I welcome comments in a moment just to remind you of the obvious that we are simply receiving the report this evening. We're not making decisions about what might happen in the future. So with that in mind, are there any colleagues who'd like to add anything in, please? Right, well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and thanks, Mark, for coming. <laughs> Uh, you are, as, as we always say, <laughs> you're welcome to stay if you'd like to. <laughs> I don't feel obliged. <laughs> now, just thank you for your time. And again, thank you to the vendors team for support. Thank you. Um, so, colleagues, on to 694, review of <laughs> civic policy. Um, and you, you will have received, or you may have got, or you may have seen a copy of the civic policy in which there are a number of fairly obvious changes, like recording the fact we've got more councillors and like what it says there. But I think there are, um, uh, there is one very significant change to be proposed. And uh, I think possibly what I'll suggest is that, um, should we start with you, and David, and then um, I know <coughs> Viv and, other, Vic and others want to uh, add something in. OK, so firstly, um, just to reiterate what uh, Mike has said in terms of cleaning up the policy with the obvious. I mean, the policy states that there's 16 councillors representing six wards. That's clearly not um, accurate. There's 18 councillors representing seven wards now. So there's the obvious things like that that needs to be cleaned up. Uh, there are numerous titles in various different guises, mayor's secretary, mayor's officer, civic secretary, civic officer. There is just the one officer position and that's civic officer. So again, we need to go through that and uh, and change that. It also refers, as, um, as Councillor Harvey reminded me today, that there's a, a, um, the toast to the Queen, as it says at the moment. It's the toast to the King now. So as long as the committee... Um, allows all of those obvious changes to be made we really are here just to deliberate the uh, the one that's highlighted in the committee officers report which was the reason this has been put on to, onto the agenda and that is um the area which selects the deputy uh, mayor the mayor elect uh in may currently it's it states that you have to serve for three consecutive uh years if that is the case, there's going to be a very fine um, group of uh, councillors that can be nominated. Uh, all are one actually have served as mayor, which is not a, an issue. Um, you know, mayors have served two terms in the past, um, maybe not consecutively until the old days, I think. But um, so the, the view is um, this was asked to go on here to see whether the committee wants to review and revise that uh, criteria. Can I just say, if you downgrade it to two years, it means that one other councillor would be um, added to that uh, to that uh, number, and that's uh, Councillor Mac McDonald. If you then went for a year service, it opens it up to um, the wider uh, council representation. We've never been in this situation before, and when uh, this was proposed and changed, I think back in 2015, I think, um, the reason we did that is because we didn't usually have such a, an overturn of councillors um, and it quite, you know, it, it sort of bobbed along quite nicely that people served their time and it was all about the experience. Previous mayors in the past have stated that they, uh, and I spoke to Terry, uh, Terry um, Jeremy before, um, even Terry as a long, and Mike, as a long serving councillor, when you get to the position of mayor, even though you've served as a councillor for a long period of time, it doesn't mean to say that you can naturally fit and uh, and understand the protocols of the mayor. So we changed also to have the deputy mayor lead into the mayor, which again uses that deputy mayor mayoral position as an apprenticeship, if you like. So I think if we did revert it back down to a year, you've also got to remember that you will serve a year as deputy mayor. One of the things that we should do as a council, if if uh, if you if you um, beg me to, um, to to give my opinion, is we need to look at the the, the position of deputy mayor a lot more 
uh, understanding me because, I mean, Chris has thankfully um, <clears throat> represented the council on a couple of occasions recently as deputy mayor, but we don't use the deputy mayor enough. And I think, you know, that that needs to be reviewed in the past, but that's something outside the policy, maybe it's just induction and protocol. So, okay. Thank you very much. I think there may be some other comments on that particular proposal. Um, it, it seems to me personally a, a, a difficult proposal to accept. I don't, I don't personally like it very much, but equally, I don't see any real alternative. So uh, um, obviously, if you want to say, oh, don't like that and could come up with an alternative that solves the problem, that would be great. Um, and I'll just suggest that we stick on this specific issue at the moment. If you wish to introduce other proposals for changes in civic policy, but not to do with um, the timing of the election, first election of, of someone to be a mayor, uh, then please leave that till later. And we'll come back to it. So any comments, please, on what you've heard so far? I, I think Vic, you're definitely the first. Um, first and foremost, this 36 page document that we got on Monday, um, we're meant to read it evaluate it and uh, and be honest uh, i've never seen the civic policy before so i don't know where the differences are i don't know yet where the changes are and i think it's a little unfair for us to be given a document two days before a meeting that we have to adopt when once again we've got no information about okay so i'd like to know where, what changes are made okay and if if like when the document i mean, I, I, I understand the the rush now because we've basically got very limited choice where so many of us are new and that make common sense but it'd be nice to have sighted this a bit earlier and more practical where the changes are okay so the changes literally uh, for this committee to 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 hone in on are to do with the selection of deputy mayor that's the one thing that you need to focus on nothing else has changed well the only other things that will change is just the obvious ones, which you can't continue with a policy. You can't change this policy after tonight for another six months. So you don't want a policy that, that has inaccuracies where people can say, actually, why are you toasting the queen and not the king? So the obvious ones, I think you can, you know, we can do those over the. So there's nothing that really needs to be thought through apart from this. This is the major change. The rest of them are cosmetic. We, to be honest, apart from, 18 councillors representing seven wards and uh, toasting the king rather than the queen. We could leave all those other titles. It's just whilst we're changing those, Vic, we might as well just be a little bit more uniform in terms of uh, identifying the officer who does most of the work in the civic area as the civic officer rather than two or three different changes. The only one we're really looking at tonight, and it's an important one to make a decision on, simply because you have to nominate who you, who's going to be deputy mayor at next week's full council. It, it states in the policy it's done in the February full council. Well, so, I, I understand that. Now, we can still run with three years, but you will be limited to those councillors. Yeah, no, no, I, I understand that. And, and yeah. I, 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 I'm reading the, the actual document. It looks sensible. But I don't know what's been changed in it. And if we get documents like this again, ideally, can we see what changes are made to the documents? Yeah, I've got, yeah. I've got no, no way of knowing no. what documents exist, uh, what they say, what they do, because I've only been on the, on the council 10 months. Can I say two, a couple of things, Rick? Uh, firstly, I, I apologise. I agree it would be very desirable that we have papers much further in advance. And it may be that when we're looking at... Um, a review of staffing in the, perhaps in the near future, we would be looking at the, the way in which we produce papers. If that means there's a stress on, on certain member staff, we have to bear that in mind. Um, I, I think, however, it's fair to say that um, what, what's been said by David about the the other proposed changes are, they, they are, I promise you, totally to do with terminology and making sense. I also point to you, point out to colleagues who are concerned about the lack of uh, information in advance that uh, we are not actually making a decision ourselves. We're recommending to full council. So um, you have an opportunity Vic, to vote uh, uh, at the full council meeting if, if you're able to come to it next week. I understand that and I appreciate your answer. But all I'm saying is if we, 
How can I recommend, as, as a member of this committee, how can I recommend a document where I don't know what the changes are? I don't know what... We get that, a 36-page document presented to us on a Monday, which we read once, twice, maybe three times. I don't know what change... It, 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 it might as well be in Arabic. I don't know what changes are made. So and when it'd, be, it'd be handy yeah. if when there are changes made to a document like that, that we can see what changes are made. Because that way... We can make an informed decision. Yeah. The, the, so, the, with, so, as the point so, you've made, but yeah. I don't think we can change it. All I can suggest is that this committee, if it wishes, could say, we don't want to make any changes this evening. We'll just leave it to the full council to do it from, in, from the cold. But I think the danger of that is that we will have less time for discussion, and there may be other issues that councils want to raise about possible changes. So, I would encourage you to feel that you should make this change tonight if you wish to do so and i fully accept the point you've made about the short notice and it's something which has been pointed out before and we really need to, do, to address it and i believe there is an opportunity to address it when we look at the roles of the members of staff we currently have so I'm, I'm in your hands colleagues you can you can you can say i don't want to talk about it anymore <laughs> or you can say we accept the short notice. We understand what you're proposing and why. That is that the um, qualification for mayor be reduced from three years to one year uh, and you go ahead. I'm in your hands. If you want to do either of those or something else, do so. But in the meantime, are there any more comments, please? Yes, there's one from Matt. Just a question. I'm sorry if we have covered this already. I just want to get it sorted in my head because of the six month thing I wasn't aware of and it's kind of flagged up. Can we not make a decision now to amend the rule regarding length of service before coming mayor and then defer everything else to a later date to give us time to address it and read in depth and so on? Because there may be other things we come across we might want to change. Yeah, you, you, the pressing issue is is the, the, yeah. the term. You certainly can. It's just that if... So, so firstly, can I just... Can I also just say... The committee officers' report was sent round, albeit late on Monday, because we we had to have a meeting with Terry in terms of town events. So we did delay that. It could have gone out on Friday. Was it uh, sufficiently early enough? Maybe not. But it does clearly state in this bit that the area, because of the elections and what happened at the elections, the bit that you are looking at tonight is changing the three-year rule. Is it says in here two years, but you can go down to one year. That's your two options. So it does tell you what you're really looking at. The only thing for me is reading the document again and, and with Chris coming back with a couple of um, things that he saw when he was looking through it. There's just two things. Forget the terminology of the mayor's officer or not. There's two things that we really need to change. And that is the toast to the king, not the queen, because it looks silly if we continue with a, a, a document for another six months. Um, and... Um, and also the 18 councillors representing seven wards. You can defer everything else. And I think over the next few months, really, this document is one of a number of policies that you'll be going through with a fine tooth comb. But you do need to, unless you decide to carry on with the three years and you will still have a nominations with one, two, three, four, five councillors next Tuesday. But if you want to expand that pool of uh, councillors to nominate, then you need to make that decision at least tonight to recommend to full council on Tuesday. Any more comments, please? <clears throat> yeah, I have one. Some time ago, we had the procedure for mayor making changed, so it counted prior time. Yeah? I don't understand what you mean. Well, we had the... Uh, example of one of our councillors who'd lost his seat came back on four years later but then they changed the procedure so oh yeah so we changed yeah so we we changed that policy as a result of that uh and this is the policy that stands so and actually at that time you you uh you performed your duties as mayor and then became deputy mayor so it was a bit of a silly so we changed all of that i think it was 2015 that we changed that um, yeah yeah Any more? Uh, if, uh, yeah. if it was changed, obviously if it's kept at three years, 
surely you'd come to a stage where we're almost in this position again. Yes. So surely going down to one year <laughs> would make it better because then you've got uh, 16, 16 <laughs> councillors. Yeah, I mean, that. Um, yeah. You, you, I mean, in the previous procedure basically said that all of the new councillors, so there's several of you that are new councillors, you couldn't even think about becoming mayor in your first term. You had to be re-elected for your second term. Yeah. What Chris is saying is there was a councillor that wasn't re-elected, but he was re-elected on the third per term, and then he served sufficient time to be considered as mayor. So it all got a bit um, complicated, and they changed the process to say that, and also they changed the deputy. So basically you were nominating the deputy mayor as mayor-elect. So they changed it around. So you served as deputy mayor and then mayor, but you could do that after three years. So technically, under this process, all the new councillors would have to wait until their fourth year to be considered, but it would still be within their first term. So we've done all of that. What we're proposing tonight is whether we change the three year to either a two year or a one year um, service. <clears throat> It doesn't make any difference, really, does it? In practical terms, whether it's one or two. It does. We run out of people if we only have one. It does, because well, two years, all you'll add to those five councillors is one more councillor, which may be fair. I don't, it's not... So it's to be one year. Mm -hmm. If we want to do that. If you want to do that. It, this is an option. Then you've also got a risk of, if you have the two years or the three years and something happens to two or three councillors that have been there for two or three years, then where does that lead you? You know, hypothetically, if the, the, the longer councillors suddenly resign or they retire, then you're in that same position, aren't you? So you are for a couple of years. Yeah. One year one one year option will be a better one because you've still got a choice of 18 councillors. Which I know it's a bit unprecedented, yeah. but it's, you know, because we're going to be having this conversation next year as well. If we do nothing, that's certainly true. We'll have the conversation again. Jerry. Yeah, I just wanted to give some um, historical perspective because before 2015, when the civic policy was introduced, you could be elected in the May and become mayor straight away. There were no rules at all. So the fact that you know we're looking at a potential change of the rules um, isn't exactly going against tradition because they've only existed for a few years <clears throat> and they were written at a time when the expectation was people would be on the council for lots of years and there wouldn't be a lot of change. So <clears throat> to think of it as a sort of a break with tradition, I think is wrong. It's 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 a relatively new thing. Uh, it worked in 2015 um, in those circumstances. Um, it, it's not something that you know is particularly workable when you've got 13 new members. I, th I think we I think we felt that um, it, it it the evidence is that now. Sorry, Matt, I'll come back to you. The evidence is now that. Uh, it does take a while to settle in as a council. There is actually a surprising amount to learn, and it's it would be dishonest of me to say that I think after one year I knew everything. I absolutely didn't. In fact, I was probably still learning well into the second um, time of election uh, after the second election. So um, I would caution us um, wanting to leap in where we can't, uh, where we could avoid it. But the difficulty is seeing how we need to. We do need to have a choice of some kind. Uh, I've forgotten who someone else wants. Was it Matt? You wanted to speak? Yeah, I actually, I, not that I'm trying to uh, round it up or anything. I actually don't think we have any other options, as you said. I think we need to accept the three options Dave has given us, at least on an interim basis, because mm -hmm. we can't keep saying Queen. Um, there are more councillors, and we're going to have this problem next year. If we dropped it to two, the problem, we're only extending it by one more year. Then after that, we're going to be narrowing down to mayors who've only just been mayor and not give anyone else the opportunity to after we've gone through people who haven't so i think we need to accept them on uh, at least on an interim yeah because you're gonna have to wait till february 2026 before you get the full quota on you yeah then you're then coming to the end of the term and then, you get voted off. And then yeah. you can all get voted off yeah <laughs> I, th I think also one of the things that <clears throat> the committee does need to consider is how we induct and and, and utilize the deputy mayor I know at times, you know, there's been political reasons why mayor and deputy mayor may not want to work together. But I think for the sake of representing the councillor, uh, the council, sorry, we
we do need to make sure that that one year as deputy mayor is, is used wisely to embed them into all the protocols and things um, ready for their mayorship. I'm going to, so, yep, please. I don't think we should waste any more time talking about it. Uh, being a representative and the people that voted for me, I don't think that many people would be that bothered about, in, you know, in terms of the people that voted for us, whether it was three or one years. I think this is just about having more choice going forward and it's as simple as that. It? However, I really take on the point that you've said, not just about this document, but any document, more time to process it before end is probably a valid point. I'm going to suggest that the, the simplest way forward I can think of uh, on the spur of the moment is that we uh, we have a vote on this specific issue. Uh, we then have a vote on the other minor changes that, uh, that have been proposed and which some of which you've heard. And I still have then to allow any councillor wishes to propose other changes that they wish to suggest. And I know for a fact that one councillor has suggested such things. So, first of all, can I propose, colleagues, that you accept the change that we've been discussing at some length about the length of time a councillor has to serve before they may stand for deputy mayor and then for mayor. So those in favour of that change, please. Okay. So do we need to say years? Sorry, sorry, Chair. Can I, can I ask what that change is? Is it one year or two years? Uh, well, we, we, we talked about one, one year. year. Okay. I think we should make it one year because that solves the problem. Two years delays the issue. Yeah. So are there any, any, just check again, support for that proposal, please. Yeah. I think we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, those against that proposal, please. When? Those abstaining, please. Well, well and on, on my site, and I accept that I do wear glasses, I see a vote of six to one in favour of the proposal. Yeah, can I just say something? Um, I'll have to reinforce your point. You know, may not predicament because I would be by terms third the next one in line, which puts me in, a, in an awkward position. That's why I'm in quiet letting the colleagues discuss it. Uh, but let me reinforce the point you made that it does take more than a term to understand what it is to be a councillor. I'm on my second term and I'm learning every day. Okay. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't think to consider myself to put myself to, to, for deputy, which is a companionship towards mayorship or even may or even mayorship on my first couple of years because you're still learning the ropes of this. I'm just saying whoever gets voted next, it should be somebody that served at least a few years that understands the position, that's all. I'm, I'm going to stick with the. I think it gives us clarity if we actually vote for or against. So I'm going to suggest that we just go on with what I proposed. The second vote would therefore be do you want to go ahead with the other minor changes, such as correcting the dates and the names that have been mentioned by David? Yep. Those who wish to agree with that proposal, please raise one hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Those against that proposal. One. Those abstaining. Right. Thank you very much. It's carried by six to one. Now, we're still on the subject because I must make it available to councillors to be able to suggest other changes to the civic policy if they should wish. Is there any councillor who wishes to make any other, who wish to make, uh, is there any councillor who wish to make any other change, please? Yes, <clears throat> I would. I, I, David hit on a really good point of the deputy mayor. Luckily or unluckily, Stuart hasn't missed very much. So theoretically, I've had no apprenticeship. All I've done is turned up and cut a ribbon at the shop, which is great. I thoroughly enjoyed it and been to two things. I've really not been involved in any of the procedural stuff at all. OK, so I would hope that moving forward, that for being on mayor, right? That I would like when I go on my summer things to take the deputy mayor with me so we can go through and learn together and support. I'm not the best, best speaker, of but to have two of us that support yeah. would, would be really good. And then they would learn and be able yeah. to shoehorn straight into the role the next year as opposed to being scared still. What's going to happen? 
I, I would suggest that doesn't need any um, agreement from us. That's the role of the, the mayor can do that. I think it's, may I say, an excellent suggestion. Um, uh, we have had mayors who've missed quite a lot of meetings or have not always been able to chair the meeting. I don't. I forget. Have you done that? Have you chaired? No, no. no. Also, no. So, so really, uh, getting at least a taste of one, one, the minimum of chairing one meeting. And I would suggest three or four or five vis visits, away visits, would be very desirable. So I think your suggestion personally is excellent, and we look forward to you carrying it out. <laughs> Can I just say something? Um, in terms of policies, I know uh, the acting town clerk is is very keen to look at all the policies because uh, I take your point, Vic. I mean, we need to we need to understand the policies ourselves in a lot more detail as. As staff, you know, we should be living by these, but sometimes, you know, policies get buried away and we don't look at them. I think um, from what some of the councillors have said, the cosmetic changes are fine and you've approved those. I think we need to be looking at this particular policy in a, in a lot more detail and bring it back in six months and actually look at what are the real responsibilities of a mayor? Why do we have a mayor? What should he be, he or she be doing? Uh, we just say it's an ambassadorial role. Well, that's quite a vague and wide. And also we can in incorporate that, you know, the deputy mayors should be encouraged to take on some of the uh, some of the activities, etc. And there's a proper induction, um, certainly in terms of the other role of the mayor, which is chairing the full council meetings. And that's a big ask for, for anyone, really. Um, so I think we need to look at that and bring the whole civic policy back in six months. It gives us much more time to look at this in more detail. Um, but thanks for approving the, the obvious ones and I'll get those changed. And there was a time not so very long ago when you became deputy mayor after your year as mayor, which always struck me as insane. And I thought it was a very good change to put it the way around so that you get the practice in. It's making sure that practice is actually available to the deputy mayor. Um, I think, uh, Stuart, you'd like to say a word about some other proposal for... Yeah, I'd, I'd like to propose that there's a... Um, I forgot the word for it. For flags. <laughs> Sorry, I just forgot the word for it. Whereas a protocol, um, so I believe there's not a protocol on the flags that we hang outside the King's house. Um, is there something we can put into that? Uh, we can, but again, you've got to decide which, uh, you know, which commemorative days, if you like, or on what occasions do we recognise <laughs> um, raising a flag uh, as a council. Uh, I mean, there's a plethora of things you can you can do that. So got, we're going to get inundated with with. Uh, I, I've drawn up say six or seven. So I've got obviously D Day this year, National Pride Day, which is 28th of June, World Holocaust Day, 27th of January, Norfolk Day, 27th of July, or it's Remembrance Day, um, Commonwealth Day, 11th of March, maybe King Charles's birthday on the 14th of November, and Portugal Day on the 10th of June. And Armed Forces Day on the 29th of June. Yeah, I'm not sure I a sense is a uh, well, I'll, I won't put words into your mouth. <clears throat> I'm happy for you to, to you to guide me as to whether we deal with that now and say yes or no to it, or whether we leave it for a, a wider review of the policy. Any thoughts, please? Ving. Can I say I, I, I agree? Flags is fairly important to a lot of people. Um, actually, setting the days that we do, I think we need to have a little bit more time to sort that out. But I certainly think we should have policy on flags. I mean, personally, I'd like to see the Fetford Town and, and the Norfolk flag fly every day. So apart, apart from national yeah. campaigns, which D-Day would be one of them, um, the only one that you've mentioned there that we actually we do something uh, physically is Commonwealth Day. Yes, we do. And why we would just isolate that day, I, I, I'm not aware of the reason. Um, but I think if we're not careful, we'll just agree a list of days without any thought given to it, because there could be a lot of people that would argue that there should be more or less of them. 
bubble. Um, I'm looking to see, is, is there any guidance from you, colleagues, do you want to go ahead with this now, or would you rather leave it as part of a general review? I actually agree with Stuart's point. I think the dates are reasonable. Um, obviously, including our actually many particular dates, it's up for discussion, but yeah, I think the plan to have fixed dates for the flag is a good idea. Okay, thank you. Um, Terry? This calls for a working group, doesn't it? Sorry? This calls for a working group. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's very grand to have a working group to decide what flags you're going to play on. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, if, if we're thinking of a general review of the civic policy, can we not simply propose in the course of time that we have a, a specific list of flags and then yeah, we we can have uh, it, we can have two couple, two or three councillors drawing up a list. Stuart would be one, presumably he's already given us a list. Is anyone else who would like to join such a supreme decide this decision making body? Carla would. That's two. Uh, it's good to have an uneven number so that you cannot possibly have a tied vote. So, is there a third person available, please? Yes, there is. Okay. It's a proper number. We've got three flag poles. Can I just clarify? We've got three votes. There's three flag poles outside. Three flag poles. Can I just say, though, as a town council, you can make a decision to fly, you know, I mean, in support of the Ukraine war, for instance, Holocaust Day, those kind of things. You don't have what what you're advocating here is having a formal policy which must be expanded into what does that mean in terms of an event? With the greatest respect, the one that I've identified, which is Commonwealth Day, with the greatest respect, it's very poorly attended. And it almost is pitiful, really, that if you're going to nominate this as something that the council really puts their support behind, we have to have some kind of, well, it's not just a protocol, it's an event behind it. So you have to also think about that. Otherwise, you're going to be rolling out every other week to raise the flag for something or other. But so I think, you know, a working group is great. You can if there's something that's really particular to your heart, you can do this now anyway. But it's it's what does what does that flag pro protocol actually include? You know, <clears throat> David, without wanting to waste a lot more time on this, can I just check something you said about Ukraine? That was what was in my mind as well. But is that appropriate for a council, or is that verging on a political? Well, statement? you've got to. That, that's what you've got to. Because I don't think that, we can make political statements. No, either. and you know, and with respect, if you're looking at one of the other ones that you know in the current climate, is is that? But that's something yeah. you make a decision on when you you decide. <clears throat> okay, can I suggest that that group arranged to meet? Would you convene that group as you were the one who introduced the idea? Thanks for doing so. Um, and I wonder whether we can risk suggesting that we move on to item 695, which is the bottom of the first page, if you've got a page like mine, uh, to receive an update for civic events in the current year ending <coughs> toward May 24. How do we go for that? So basically, just to let you know that um, the mayoral and the civic season, if that's the right terminology of events, has now drawn to a close. We've delivered... Uh, all of uh, those ones that we recognise uh, within the council. So that's mayor making the civic reception, civic church service, Christmas carol service and the Christmas lunch for the elderly on the mayoral event side. On the civic side, back the Britain reception, Remembrance Sunday reception. And last year was the King's coronation, which was uh, on the 6th of May. The only other event, and uh, it's more personal and specific to a mayor, um, is the Mayor's Civic Ball, which is on the 19th of April. And that will definitely complete um, those events. <clears throat> Looking forward uh, to 2024-25, we will then deliver all of those, apart from King's coronation. Um, never know. Never know. Um, but we will include uh, the D-Day 80th anniversary. Uh, and also there's discussions um, that in a later agenda item in this meeting, whether we, um, have a greater involvement in Remembrance Sunday in terms of organising and delivering the parade as well as the reception. And also, even though it's not technically uh, a town event, it's more a venue event. Uh, I know, Vic, uh, you mentioned it in a previous meeting, you'll be pleased that we actually are um, taking on the uh, 
the responsibility of delivering a remembrance concert on Friday the 8th of November leading up to that. So we will be doing that uh, this year. <clears throat> um, and that pretty much brings that on. Right, unless you. anybody's got any questions. Okay. We'll move straight on then to 696, which is civic and remembrance events. Um, it's pretty much an overlap there, but well, there, there is, there, there isn't, there isn't. This is, this is really uh, something that Mac took on from last meeting on the 20th of December. We talked about our um, our uh, sort of inclination to deliver and be more involved in the remembrance parade, and not just have a responsibility to deliver in a reception after the event. Um, and he also wanted the, to, um, to to set out uh, a real protocol because some of the new councillors were saying that they, they went into that event. And it's a big event for the town. They went into that event without understanding what their role was. Um, so I know he's only, again, just sent this around. Uh, we have time to, to take this in and digest it. And Mac will, has apologised, he can't be here tonight, but we will bring it back up in April. Um, I know there are issues at the Royal British Legion Club um, and they've got a new committee, which hopefully will put them on a more sustainable footing. But I think this is a real timely thing that we should be considering because we never know um, by November they might not be in a position. And with the death of John Wayne last year, who was the parade master for the Royal British Legion, they were at the 11th hour put in a bit of a predicament uh, to carry out the parade um, process. So I think it's only right that we, together with Aria Ponington, who is one of our Freedom of the Town recipients, to take a greater role in delivering this in November of this year. So what MAC is also asking for, and I don't know whether those councillors um, who are looking at some of the civic policy, again, want to put themselves forward, but one of the things that MAC wants to do, because he knows there's a lot more work to be done on this, is he wants to set up a working group if, if the committee are in agreement and he's asking for three councillors um, actually does identify you, Vic, as possibly one of those three <laughs> to put a bit of pressure on you um, to be part of that, to actually flesh this out, uh, to be represented in April when we when we come back and meet. <clears throat> Thank you for doing that. It's very unfortunate that Matt can't be here today. Uh, Vic, you put your hand up, I think. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, just a couple of points. One is I've, I've, I've read the document, obviously. Um, again, it would have been nice to get Longer site, but that's not being all there. Um, so I am a little concerned with some of the things that's in it. A, the timing of the event, it doesn't give uh, religious groups the chance for their, their part of it. It basically is you march in, um, the bugler goes, you lay your roots and you march off, and it's not what this town's been used to. So I'm not entirely happy with the makeup of it is at the moment and also there is very much a case of the Royal British Legion is sort of there in attendance they can do their bit but the rest of it's ours and it's nothing to do with them that's what seems to come across that may not be I might be a little unfair with that but um, if it's a member of parade I would like the Royal British Legion very much involved it's not to do with the club whether the club closes or not the Royal British Legion will still be running as the Royal British Legion so whatever happens with the club, that's neither here nor there. And the last point is, yes, I would like to be involved with that working group because a uh, previous meeting I did say that I would liaise with British Legion and I would still like to, to do that. So, yes, I'll, I'll be on the working group. My understanding was that Mac Wood said he would talk to the British Legion. Do you know whether he has done? I don't know that, no. <coughs> I haven't. Uh, since before Christmas, purely because I was going to and I've been laid up. But I'm now back on my feet and I will be doing that either this week or next week. I'll get old Rebecca and and we'll go from from there. Well, well, but Matt did say that he wants to set the meeting up before the next meeting. He, he's talking March, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'll so, do yeah. that. So so you're, you're happy to be a member of his subcommittee? Or his... Absolutely. Would anyone else like to volunteer, please? Carla. Carla got a hand up. Thank you, Carla. Right, 
I'm grateful for your support, colleagues, on that, and I think that's the correct way forward with Matt not being here. Terry, do you want to add? I to make a point. I think it's really important the council is quite sensitive about this subject because the, the RBL have been delivering this, um, you know, for a long while, and they've done a really good job. And I think what I want to stress is. Um, I very much want it to be seen as us supporting and enabling it to happen, not taking it over. They have a lot of expertise. They've done this for a long while. And we're adding to, not taking over from. And I think, I know we all know that, but I think it's really important that we say that and bear that in mind uh, as we progress. It's absolutely vital. And I think I think both Mac and Vic are aware of that. And, and to some extent, they were chosen because of their relationship with the Royal British Legion. Uh, and we have to be absolutely clear, all of us, that we are not taking it over. And if Royal British Legion want us to, I mean, it, technically, they would be inviting us to either support them or, or take the lead. That's what it amounts to. Carla. I'm just going to say I fully agree with Terry on this one. I think that's part of the reason why I joined Vic and Mac on this one. Um, I, because I'm going partial, I get along really well with some of the members of the British Legion and option. Um, I would like to work on a plan with Vic and Mac's guidance that really brings both entities together with less possible friction, <laughs> let's put it that way. They did deliver this for a very long time, so it's very historical. It's, 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 it's almost imperative that they are part of it in some in some sense, but which format that's going to take, that's what hopefully we can work out. Thank you. Um, hang on, excuse me a minute. Anne first, and then. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, reading this, it sounded so um, heavily weighted towards like the military side. It was too much, you know, parading and that sort of thing. My understanding of the Remnant State Services from being a child and growing up is it was a religious service and the church was involved. It's hardly mentioned in this. So I think if we're going to support doing it, we should look at both sides, not just, you know, the parade side and, um, you know, the salute or whatever. I just felt it was really an uncomfortable document. I didn't like it at all. I thought it was very one-sided and didn't reflect what Remembrance Day is about at all. I mean, that that was just my my feeling about it. I didn't didn't think it was very balanced at all and wouldn't be something I'd want to support. Right. I think I think that. We need to hear you on that. Uh, Chris and yeah, Carla. Just want some clarification, please. It says on this could, this could be a final briefing on November the something or other. And it says TGC. Would that be the mayor and deputy mayor as well? So I think I think what Mac means there is I, th I think he is alluding to us taking it over. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I think that's where the briefing is. It's, yeah, yeah, it is, but I mean, but, I think, but I think also one of the uh, one of the uh, the things came out of the last committee meeting was the council didn't feel as if they were adequately briefed by the civic officer as to what was did you know demanded of them in terms of the process and the parade, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, I think that's something as officers that we need to look at that and make sure we do that. And it could be embedded in this document. So is that you? It's a yes. Carla. Carla, please. but yes. Um, when it comes to the preparation of understanding what, what our role is when expected of us, but we had this conversation up with this meeting we and we, it, we, we more pretty much defined that we're going to put some sort of, uh, you know, Step by step, sort of bullet point guide of what is expected of people before going to this event, particularly if the new council has never done it before. So I think we've already covered this before, yeah. and I fully support it. I think it's easier for new people coming along to understand it. Uh, the second one, and this is a bit of a touchy subject because obviously the whole event includes, you know, the, the religion includes the, the, the civic side of things and the religious, the, the religious group sides of things. But not everybody um, may or may not, so not everybody may be on board with supporting the religious group. So it puts some people in an awkward position. You let me finish. <laughs> I, I fully agree that by tradition, I particularly like to involve those things because this been tradition is part of the whole the whole sense of community involvement of, of what it is. But there's gotta be a balance. And I think that's where the mayor and the deputy mayor and whenever the next deputy mayor need to work together. And Chris had a good point. If we have a two uh, two people that work very well together on those events, even if they don't agree 
on, on similar views about how those event, events should go ahead. One might not be up for it, but there will always be the other one that can fill in and, and, and fill up that gap and continue to build those events despite their, their ideals of their beliefs. That's just a point in this. Mm -hmm. Um, Can I just come back on that? I understand that not everybody has any kind of religious belief. That's that's not what I'm saying. I was saying this is too weighted away from what the Remembrance Day service has always been about. And, and it doesn't matter to me whether you're religious or not. I think the church should, has always traditionally been involved. I mean, not everybody has a military background or is a comfortable, and I'm certainly not comfortable, with this sort of parade. Um, so I think, I, I just don't think it's a balanced document. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. OK. Um, we, we have discussed it, and we have got a, a committee to take it forward. I'm suggesting we move on now to 697, which is town events. So at the last meeting, we did uh, mention um, roughly what our town events would be. I think this committee, in its terms of reference, has to uh, approve and um, adopt uh, a list of town events uh, for the for the uh, forthcoming year. And we, we didn't actually do that as a committee. We discussed it, um, but now what we are doing as officers, Katie's here, she'll give you a bit more detail on some of these events uh, if you so wish. This is the proposal for the town events that we are suggesting. <laughs> um, it's similar to last year in terms of, uh, because we thought last year's uh, events program was pretty successful in, in terms of Seaside Special and Whitson, et cetera. Um, so we are proposing within the budget that these will be the list of town events. There's obviously other events that are proposed throughout the year. Um, and we'll go on to another slide which shows a couple of those. The marketplace events are a schedule of several events throughout the uh, period of um, April through to uh, October, November time. Um, but these are the key town events that we will we will be delivering. It says in August 2024, Crofton Perry weekend. I mean, Crofton Perry to some may mean a lot, to others, it, what's that all about? So that's just a working title at the moment. We will come up with something slightly different. Um, but again, it's we thought the Seaside Special was really successful last year. So we want to bring back that Seaside vibe. Uh, Crofton Perry did a, a load of um, classic British sitcoms. So for the uh, for the oldies of the nostalgia trip back to the Heidi highs and the and the dad's army and the aloe aloe and, and, and such like will bring uh, quite a few visitors, we think, into that weekend. But also in terms of the youngsters who have no inclination or uh, understanding of what Croft and Perry did, it's going to be a holiday camp vibe with sea with sand pits and puppet shows and all the rest of it. So it will still be that kind of event in August that we sort of delivered um, or touched on uh, last August, and this is just expanding it. Um, so, really, we need you to approve that list <laughs> or certainly ask any questions before we do so. Vic? Um, well, what we're getting D Day, yeah. what have we actually got? Because I think we should have a massive D Day party. Yeah. So, that's why we brought that Come in on. because uh, June the 6th, which is a Thursday, is the national day of um, D-Day uh, celebrations in terms of beacon lighting and the commemorative services and things. So from Thursday all the way through to Sunday, we will continue that theme. And that's why that's classified as World War Weekend. So we'll have a, several different events throughout that weekend. Uh, start I've not actually got any meat on the bones yet. Katie will fill you in a little bit on that one. Yeah, so our idea is so for actual the, the D-Day days the sixth obviously um we're going to get the schools involved and they're all making crosses for the the men that um lost their lives from thetford they're also doing an art installation project that will hopefully be then in the guild hall that people can go and visit um on that day and obviously then we'll have the beacon lighting we were speaking to terry last week about how dull our beacon is sometimes when we light it and it's like a little bunsen burner so we want to make it a lot bigger so we've been yeah. speaking to kind of some of the community groups as well and doing a 
a big beacon parade. Obviously, we've got some lanterns, get the schools involved to then sing the same song and potentially <laughs> the beacon lighting outside King's House rather than on the marketplace. And then maybe parade up to the marketplace to have um, projections and recordings of uh, D-Day survivors and D-Day stories and make it kind of a light spectacle so that our kind of Bunsen burner doesn't look so dull. Bunsen burnery. Bunsen burnery, yeah. yeah. Um, and then to have uh, that kind of party, like you're talking about celebration on the Friday evening with either a kind of 40s dance or kind of a um, that kind of big band dance in the Carnegie slash Guildhall. And then over the, you want to go? Well, we can't, we can't do it in the Carnegie because no. Friday the 8th is actually the Mayor's Civic Reception. Yes. So the Mayor's Civic Reception will have that theme. We've already spoken yes. to Chris and we'll carry up theme on with his Civic Reception, but we could still have something in the marketplace and in the for the general court. public. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Well, band, it, that's possibly something on the Sunday, a mm -hmm. Sunday afternoon. So again, we want to carry it all the way through. So yeah. there's something different every day because Again, some people may not even be able to come along on the Thursday and the Friday because of work commitments, mm. but the weekend uh, they may well be able to. So, and yeah, and the then schools, also, sorry, yeah. yeah, and then also over the weekend um, we had great success uh, last year and the year before with something called Thetford Dungeons and the Shadows of Thetford, which turned the Guildhall into an immersive experience for audiences. We sold out um, within hours; they were really, really popular. Um, so we're going to turn the guild hall into an immersive war experience where people would come in. So they'd kind of buy tickets, they'd come in and they'd sign up to go to obviously off to D-Day and, and kind of have that background with live actors. Go into the large court where it would be kind of a World War hospital and be taken through to the council chamber where it would be the ops room where they'd um, have got the plans that they had for D-Day. So they'd watch that actually happen. Then they'd go upstairs where potentially the art installation um, that the schools have done would be, and it would be a moment of reflection with maybe some monologues. Then they come back downstairs to get their ration books and their food parcel from the tea room again, and then back into the large court for a 1940s dance. And then we could do that over several several times over that weekend as well. So that's kind of the meat we've got so far. Is there any plans for, say, a concert in King's Gardens? Not at the moment, no. Just that weekend or just in general? That weekend to celebrate D-Day. Um, obviously, I didn't, realize, I, forgot, I didn't realize Saturday was going to be for old Chris Harvey over there. There you go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe yeah. some, Sunday afternoon yeah. would be the combination of the, you know, the end of the celebration. Yeah, you know, if you get some loads, loads of that sort of showcase some local talent, yeah. um, some singers sort of singing songs, We did a World War weekend last year, which I'll touch on in my presentation, and we had we kind of had singers, we had reenactors, and and that went down really well. And that was in the marketplace, and we could easily do something in the equivalent is what? Oh yeah, a swing event. Yeah, that's what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, like a swing. A 1940. Yeah. Yeah. So we have the Carnegie on the uh, on on the um, Saturday evening. So we are talk we are thinking about having a 1940s swing band, yeah. etc. So again, I wish it would be easier to deliver because Chris's Friday night will be themed in that in that guys anyway. So sorry. Do you want to come back? No, so fine. I was just thinking something. Matt, else. did you at one time have a hand up? Yeah, and and I. Looks great, and I mean this with no disrespect to any previous events. But I would rather we did less and knock them out of the park than did a lot and they're subpar. And we've been to a lot of events, and some of them are really, really good, and some of them I'm like, oh my god, I'm embarrassed. And and I please don't take that in a, in a, in a mean way. But if we're we're going to be going, we're going to be gunning with this. We need to do it well. We need to look at increasing our promotion. The dungeons are fantastic. Great idea for the five people at a time who are in there. What are we doing outside for the rest of the public and, and stuff like that? Um, our itinerary is being published so people know what time to come and things. And I love the market, the continental markets. Fantastic ideas. I think they were brilliant. And I had my, my body weight in food while I was there. But we can't just slap something on top of it because we know we've got a captive audience while they're there. Um, I just think that if we're going to do it, I would rather chop something off and do the rest really well than just float through everything. And, it's, and I'm glad the beacon was mentioned because mortified last time. It was like someone on the top with a lighter. 
Um, have we got a new beacon sorted? Well, those, be those beacons were, um, they were something that was nationally promoted through the, the, the campaign. Um, they were gas lit, so they were safe. The problem, the problem for us is they're, they're stuck on top of the flat roof, so they're higher away, so it looks even smaller. Um, the last time we had a proper brazier, it was at the top of Castle Hill. But then logistically, it was a nightmare because you have to have a fire tender on duty all the time. You have to have a plethora of people sort of supporting, you know, the guy that's you have to have. Logistically, it was a nightmare. Um, so we need to find somewhere outside the marketplace that we could potentially have that kind of beacon. Um, and we did have a discussion the other day that we've got a we've got a location outside this place, which could be just that location. And do we have a beacon ready for that? Well, we have a beacon that well, we have the the, the the sort of guts of a beacon that sits out here that is used on uh, top of Castle Hill. But we need to have it modified. And we we again we will be talking to one of the um, uh, factories that can possibly do that for us, because it was it was pitiful to be honest. Um, and we did have a lot of people turn out, as we usually do for Thetford events, to be fair. Um, so we need to improve that. In terms of um, scaling down to make sure we do it better, I, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, Matt. And one of the things that we did look at these weekends is the continental market is there for four days. They don't come for any less than four days. And if we have was really being super critical, uh, and we usually are with our debriefs as well, uh, we we performed really well for a couple of days, but then it petered out. Yeah. And we need to make sure that we we you know we continue to deliver over the four days ourselves, because you're right. The continental market brings hundreds, if not thousands, of people into the town, so we have a captive audience. Um, in terms of what we're proposing or what Katie's proposed, I think it's manageable because if we're going to theme the Carnegie in a 1940s style on a Friday, it carries over fairly easily into Saturday. Um, and the experience we've delivered before, and I, I'm not sure where the five people came from because it was packed when I actually went on it, and it's a lot. But you, it's something that you you cannot you cannot skimp on it. It has to be something really immersive and really atmospheric. That's the thing that we need to concentrate on more than anything. Um, and that's where some of the budget that we've got for this will be invested in. But I think what we've planned for it is manageable as long as we address the beacon lighting, because that will be the thing that's nationally advertised. Um, but we're also talking to people from Keystone and schools and things like that, which will join a parade that culminates where the beacon lighting is. So. So again, we've not really had anything like that since the 100 torch parade. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's something that we're confident that we can deliver. But Thank you, I've got Stuart. Uh, sorry, sorry, I've got... sorry, Mark, can I just say one more thing? Just one more thing, because, um, you know, if you do think we fail on anything and it's not up to your expectations, what I would ask is for you to tell us, be really blunt and tell us, what I'd also appreciate is if it happens, don't save it up for seven weeks to talk about it in this meeting because we haven't got time. Because if we're really failing, we need to have a, <clears throat> a critical debrief. Um, so if something has been embarrassing, then we need to know. I think just just to, just to answer, I don't think anyone's failed. I think it's accepting mediocrity is sometimes the problem. But I don't think anyone's failed. I think the staff work very hard. You all do. You all work very hard. Chris and Stuart and then Ferry Land. <clears throat> I'm a great believer in this celebration is D-Day. I'm really not convinced to have people wonder about the Gratian books aligned with D-Day. D-Day was we had um, Americans, we had Europeans, we had soldiers going onto the beaches. This is what we want to react to show the children mm -hmm. what these soldiers mm -hmm. went through. Not the fact that the people here had fashion books, everyone knows that, mm -hmm. you know, but to see like four Americans on Omaha Beach and got all those cliffs they had to climb, mm -hmm. being machine gunned and all sorts of stuff, possibly give people some kind of, a, possibly not, of an effect of possibly coming out of a landing craft. Mm -hmm. You know, you say the adversary thing, and then not do that, you know, coming out of a landing craft while under fire. We all would see Private Ryan, 
what happens in more subject winter. This is what we've got to get across, yeah. you know, because we've got to realise that what our soldiers did on this day, we, we can sit here and discuss mm -hmm. yeah. You know, commemoration, not celebration. That's right, you yeah. know, and, and it was a war against fascism, you all know, and you know, that's the best no, but we really have to celebrate. And lots of people from that, but their parents died um, and fought in D Day. Mm -hmm. And to sort of demean it slightly and knock it down, and, uh, let's have an historic thing about Brasher you know. Beach of Field the immersive side, possibly, I don't know, to be able to be to think they're climbing up cliffs or coming out, but we've got a sand bit, you can put a landing drop on there, <laughs> you know, that's something along that. And if whatever you do, I'd like to be involved. Yeah. Along with, well, there's going to be technology to it. But I would like to make sure that it D Day celebration, not a celebration of the World War. That's different. The year after is. The yeah, that's fine to do the other bit. Yeah. This is just the leader, mm -hmm. you know, because this is what made Europe free. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to suggest, Katie, that we bring the subject up again in a month's time. Yeah. Sorry, in two months, no, two months' time. So we're talking about uh, April, aren't we? The last opportunity for the D-Day one before it takes place. So we need to have that crystal clear then. Right, I think we've now got Stuart and then Terry Land and then Vic. What? What I would like to see, I know it sounds like I can visualise it, is more or less educating or more or less a history lesson for the young people of using the guild hall. Now, build like a, a, a bomb shelter. Mm -hmm. They, if the siren goes off, they go into the bomb shelter, they heal the blast, etc. And they come out the other side and obviously there's ruins and fires, etc. To get them to sort of realise what and like the last generation went through yeah. and the significance that D-Day brought. Yeah, um, that was one of our ideas. So obviously, with all the big events that we normally do, we normally have a school's day on the Friday, mm -hmm. so that would be inviting them to experience. And one of the things was we were going to create that that air raid shelter. And I know what you're saying about the, the D-Day, but there was other effects off the back of that, off, off of D-Day that we, we could show as well. So I think, yeah, I think we can definitely come up with something that, that works for everybody. But also the school's exhibition in the upper gallery um, is on the back of um, our work within the schools mm -hmm. or our proposed work within the schools. So people will be going in there teaching them those things. And also in the council chamber, you did talk about, um, you know, that's an ops room. Mm -hmm. So it's actually delving into, you know, how they planned, um, you know, the actual... And I'd also like to see after the D Day event, almost like through the through the next year, year and what happened up to VE Day, mm -hmm. you know, little events yeah, that nice. took yeah. place that we can sort of, you know, highlight and say, you know, the war still wasn't fully over until yeah, yeah. VE Day. Mm -hmm. I think because then by the time they get to VE Day, they, you know, these young people probably, oh, you know, this is why it's happened, not just to get us another. Yeah, that's quite idea. Yeah, so uh, uh, some more thinking and some more reporting. Um, Terry Land, please. Yeah, um, this is sort of my bag, really, but um, how would the market traders, the existing market traders, not the continental ones, how would they um, expect it to be part of these events? Well, we haven't spoken to... Um, well, the, the, the continental market, I'm not sure. We'll have to speak to R&R uh, &R, um, as to whether... I mean, they were, you know, they were very, we did speak to them about Christmas and some of their traders actually engaged with, you know, dressing their gazebos and things up in the Christmas theme. Not all of them did. Um, so oh, I'm talking know, about existing market traders. Our trade. existing market traders. We need to speak to them and see whether they want to get involved um, and how can they get involved. We know um, they are very, you know, they are very receptive because they know that when we do events, especially on the market day, it does increase trade for them. Um, and I'm, I'm very keen that they don't get left behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, whenever we've done events on the marketplace, we've, we've always spoken to them because them. sometimes it's a fair point. we have to tweak their their pitch locations. I'm, I've got to be honest, that's not what I've been told, Kate. Okay, then I, I'm, I'm, be being, I'm being blunt. Yeah, no, I'm happy for that if, as long as that information gets fed back to us yeah. because I went round to every single market trader mm -hmm. when I've done any weekend event 
Um, yeah. Even had some of them in costume, so I, I would love to know who. This is the sort of thing. Who said that they weren't involved? Because I mean, we have that. Like Christmas lights switch on. I go to every single shop in town as well yeah. but, and get them involved. But in so terms of the week, to know who said that they weren't involved. In terms of the yeah. weekly market, we do have to have conversations with them when we do uh, events yeah. that that are, we need are doing, because we need the space. So sometimes we <laughs> tweak them slightly so it's with their permission yeah. and involvement. Because as I say, they're they're usually quite keen because they know it will bring additional footfall onto the market. I've even had that in the stocks. And I think we I think I'm right in saying that we agreed that the continental market would extend onto the marketplace. Well, that's only if they're willing to do that, Terry, because we have we did speak well, to we did speak. Okay, to, that's that's new information for me. Well, we did speak to the uh, continental uh, traders last time before Christmas. We said because we were. We knew that actually come Saturday uh, or Sunday, sorry, that we wouldn't have a lot more on the market. So it would be a bit of a dead space. And that's why we're saying our plans now are to make sure that we extend the program from Thursday through to Sunday. Um, but they were very reticent in in leaving the high street because um, we wanted to say, can't you pull some food vendors off? There's supposed to be other events on there on the Sunday, aren't there? No, but what, what, you can't, what you can't do... So that, that, works, that works doubly. It works for the traders and it works for the market. But what you can't do is you can't say to a continental market trader, pitch up Tuesday and Thursday, clear off on Saturday. I'm not suggesting that. I think it was the whole Saturday thing. So, if they were the, so Lee, who runs Rapid Events, he was happy to come onto the marketplace, but he would have to move his stalls on Saturday because obviously our market is pretty much full on a Saturday. So it's where he then puts those stools. So it's a case of us maybe having that conversation again and saying, look, because the trouble is it could be that he just puts two stools on the marketplace because of how full okay. our market so is. So at the last um, uh, market venues and comms, we agreed that that was going to happen. So are we now not agreeing that's no, going to happen? What say, no, what we're saying is that... so. If we do get some of the continental market traders and we can persuade them to be on the market Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, what we need to make sure is we're, we're not going to have a dead space Thursday, Friday and Sunday because on Saturday it won't be because the rest of us... So, so now I'm confused. Are we doing it or not? We are doing it, but but it's only because we're, we're focusing more on making sure there's activity to support. <coughs> and I think... <laughs> that's why we may well be able to persuade them. We couldn't before because they said, well, what's going to be here Sunday? And there wasn't anything really. Um, so we need to make sure that our programme is sufficient enough to make sure that they, they're not left out on a limb. And potentially maybe speaking to some of the other traders, because I know people like um, Ali and I can't remember who, and Joe when we first did first continental market yeah. they came every day that the continental market was there so it might be a case of speaking to them and That's saying the would you come again on the we're, other we're, day we're screaming as a market for a hot food offering okay. if we have one it would be mad not to use it wouldn't it mm -hmm. thank you um vic you you a long time ago you wanted to speak yeah. i'm just going to reiterate what chris said that d-day is like the d-day stuff mm -hmm. next year we're going to have a massive Party as well for VE Day. Yeah. Uh, and so we don't want to go to an old victory. It's not it's D Day. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to reflect what was happening at that time 80 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so next next year we'll be doing it again, we're celebrating the end of the war. So that was that was just my, my point. I think it is a celebration though this year as well of 80 years so it's celebrating that 80 years so i feel like yeah, you can yeah. have an element of celebration about d-day mm. like you're saying like a big band kind of thing to so have that kind of element but then, then potentially then. have your street parties and things like that next year for ve day so do it the celebration in a different way go with jay please um, just so I'm very pleased to see the program mapped, mapped out. I think it's a good spread over the year, which is helpful. And it's not just, you know, a couple of hours. It's it's a package, which I think is is nice. Um, and, you know, I agree with the previous comments about uh, doing less and doing it well. I think it's really important that we uh, have a quality offering as a town council. So um, I wish you well with that. I'm slightly nervous about the reliance on the continental market because it's a bit like uh, it's work, we're going to keep rolling them out all the time. It doesn't cost us anything, but they also don't pay us anything. Yeah. Um, so I'm conscious of that. Um, we put on events for two reasons. One, because the feel-good factor, and we want to give people something to do. 
but we also put them on to bring people into the town centre to help you know local traders and business so I, I hear what you're saying about engaging with town centre retailers with market traders brilliant I'd ask that we really you know focus on that we put the events on to bring people into the town centre we want them to spend money with people that are here all year round not just money with the continental market that's here three times a year mm -hmm. you know that's largely why we do events to, to help the local economy and all the rest of it but we can't overlook that aspect in, in, in my view so mm -hmm. love it all and i think if we as councillors can help with any of that mm -hmm. um in terms of any of the events up there then you know use the councillors as well as anything else Right, thank you. I think we've given it a, a good cheer and I'm grateful for the progress we've made and obviously more progress to, to come. So I'm going to suggest that we move on to 698 colleagues, event sponsorship framework. Uh, we have, um, we're, not, we're not coming new to this, Matt, but if you'd like to take us on, please do. So um, last meeting, um, you very kindly brought that information, um, which was greatly appreciated about how we can increase uh, sponsorship as the year goes. The ideas of um, the Christmas tree baubles and um, the, I think it was the, the A-frame outside that states who sponsored things for us around Christmas time, all excellent ideas, love them all. Um, that part I'm fine with. The bit that I'm wanting more scrutiny and more awareness on is what people who sponsor our events it's being made aware to the public what they are sponsoring. Yeah. Um, so if you sponsor, just an example, if you sponsor the signs for an event, I want it to be very, very clear that you paid for the signage, not the event. And we've had a couple of events I've been to and it looks like, and it's just the way it looks, it's no one's fault, but it looks like that company paid for the whole of the Christmas event. And we're, we're underselling ourselves and the hard work that you and the team um, put into these events and we're absolutely over delivering to, to someone who's only paid for one little thing so I think the, the proposal that I sort of have is that any event in which so, um, a company or a local business wants to sponsor that it's um, scrutinized by the chair or the vice chair first before approval just to make sure because we have I just I, I have concerns about um, there's no I'm trying to find the right words. The, screw, I'm sorry, there's no scrutiny. We could be saying yes, you give us that. We have no idea the relations between certain people, how how that's been paid for, who's paid for it, uh, what they're getting out of it. So I just think what I would prefer is it to have um, chair and vice chair oversight. Um, at any any event in which a company gives us money, because if they're saying that if they give us money to pay for the high visits. I want the high visits to say this high vis was paid for by X Y Z, not the whole event. Thank you. Do you want to I digress? Are you happy to just rest it there, or do you want? To no, I open the floor. floor. I open the floor. Oops. And we've got. No, I'll let it. I'll let it. <laughs> Carlos, Carlos. Carlos. I, I like the idea of. Um, company to sponsor an event. I'd love to see like the, the, the D-Day event, uh, maybe a company pays for the band, because mm -hmm. that takes the onerous off of us. Mm -hmm. So we can then invest that, reinvest the money that we've saved on that into delivering more town events. So it's a great idea that they do. But like Matt said, it is if they're paying for the band, then the band was sponsored by XYZ. Um, the, the posters were, were by XYZ. That's fine, but what, what Matt's worrying about, and I think is right, is that event sponsored by, and all they've done is give us 100 quid to put some posts in there. Um, that's abusing the, the, the system that we've got for sponsorship. I love the idea of sponsorship because we can deliver more. Mm -hmm. Jerry, and um, I think Matt's alluded to this, but I would stress um, the part of the problem with this is we're, we're selling ourselves so short. We could make a lot of money out of this, but we're, we're selling off an entire event, for, as Matt said, for a sake of whatever it is, a couple of high-vis vests or, or something else. Um, we should be selling ourselves properly and making real money out of this instead of just peanuts for, for people who, who get an exceptional deal.
<laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> no, it's a good one. Has everybody, has everybody had their say? I, to be honest, uh, when Matt brought this up, I, I was actually really pleased because actually um, we don't have a system. We don't. We've not had one for a long, long time. Uh, I think we're going back to Morris Howard as town clerk when we when we had um, something even anywhere near this, and maybe before that we used to we used to have like the hanging basket thing out there that actually identified the fifty people that chipped in to to sort of help support them. I think this is this is really good that we do this because then as officers we're absolutely clear where I and and. And I've had some experience in dealing with um, big sponsors in the past and where. And I remember when we had the first meeting with up, I actually sat down with their area manager and said, what is it that you want to get for your investment? Because I don't want to sit here in a year and you tell me that I've shortchanged you because we haven't done this. So event sponsorship formats are extremely important for both sides. Um, and I think actually signing off, so, I mean, signing off the, the agreement should be the councillor's um, prerogative. I think we just do the work to try and bring the nitty gritty. Where I'm struggling, Matt, is I want to know what the structure is in terms of if we were going to go for an event sponsor, for instance, we go for an event sponsor that's going to sponsor the whole of those events, full stop. If you're going to have a band on one of those events, you have a little banner in front of it and we've sold the stage sponsorship, so anybody that jumps on that stage to play music and all the rest of it gets it. But it will still have the event sponsor set for town council's event sponsor for 2024 25 is blah blah with their logo. That makes it a lot simpler. That gives us a, the opportunity to go for a bigger sum of money because they are sponsoring our whole events program, which is then going to attract. We can tell them, you know, for some of these events, we attract two, three thousand people into the town centre times that by five. And, you know, that's something that's worth them investing money. So I think there's a there's still a lot of work to do, but I'm conscious that we're losing time in terms of one of the big things that I think would attract a sponsor. And that's our floral displays, because they're always um, recognised as something special. Uh, they're always fantastic. And I think that's something that we do need to to sell quickly. So I would ask that we have some councillor input, but and maybe Katie and I, you know, try and put some meat on the bones, but we need to do this quickly. But I would be, a, I wouldn't be, I don't want necessarily to suggest that we have high vis sponsors. Oh, you're absolutely right. You know, we had someone that actually offered us some banners to highlight Christmas lights. But when you looked at it, it could be perceived that they were sponsoring the whole event, which Christmas light switch on is a huge event for the town. And they got a huge event sponsorship and profile for very little return. So I don't want to do that. I want I want it really, you know, signed off. Mm -hmm. And I think we go for three, four, maybe big sponsors. Uh, and then the sponsors know where they where they sit. We know we can deliver it on, on their behalf and their benefit. And we'll get the financial benefit to invest in all the stuff that everybody keeps dreaming up. <laughs> big fires that the kids are going to climb out of because they're just, you know, blown up a tank or something. Yeah. So that all costs money, unfortunately, and we need money. So I'll just ask if Terry Lambs, are you happy with that now? Or? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I just think we need to sell ourselves better. <laughs> Terry Jane. Um, at the last uh, amenities meeting, we spoke about hanging baskets and uh, the various hubs around town um, because historically we used to get quite a lot of money from hanging baskets sponsorship um, and then it became quite difficult and then we kind of just stopped even asking. Um, we agreed at the last meeting that it would be £50 per basket and £150 per barrel. They're the free tier planters outside the post office and the uh, Green Dragon roundabout and various other places in town um, and uh, there'd be a sort of package of what you get uh, there'd be a, normally a poster with a list of all hanging basket sponsors and in the tubs and barrels there'd be a little plaque. easy to do with 
240 hanging baskets, because also it's roughly 50 quid. I think what will be really useful for all of the events is the there's a lot more variety with the costs, you know, one band costs a lot different to another band and uh, that sort of thing. Um, I think probably someone needs to map out all of the different sponsorship opportunities that we've got and some indicative prices. And you've almost got a menu there to go to different companies. I mean, somebody might like to sponsor our conservation work on Barnum Common, for example, um, just having spent 10 grand cutting the various trees and bushes there, lovely for someone else to pay for that. Um, but yeah, actually we could come up with quite a nice menu and actually be relevant to, it could be 50 quid or it could be 5,000 know, pounds. So but I think officers need to look at the different options across the different committees uh, and then take it from there. Sorry, Mike, um, one further one. If we're going to do this, and I think we should, we need to market it properly. So that means proper publicity, doesn't it? We need to we need to let people know that this is what is on offer. Made. Right. We 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 are taking that forward. We we hope and uh, I think it's general agreement around the table. So um, pausing in case anyone else wants to come on, but no one does. So six nine nine financial report for the. 10 months ended January. Um, it, hopefully we can go through this at some point. Yeah, this, but... yeah, this, this is, uh, I mean, to be honest, just looking at the finance uh, report, we, we've delivered within budget on, on all major areas. So there's nothing really to, uh, to, to red flag. Um, and as I said, most of these mayoral events, civic events, Town events, they've all they've all been delivered now. They've all been completed. So the next few months for us is is not in terms of delivery. It's to make sure planning for next year, but it doesn't sit within this. So um, there's nothing really to uh, to highlight. As I said, everything has come within uh, budget. So no red flags there. The only thing I would say is the Christmas lights. Um, the contractors tender was for three years. It's complete completed uh, last Christmas light. So we will be going out uh, to tender very soon uh, for a new contractor or, or the same contractor, depends whoever wins it, um, going forward. Um, Any comments, please? <laughs> Just a comment on, on that. I am shocked at the cost of the lights. I was shocked when I saw it the first time and it shocked me again. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Is when it comes to going out to tender, do we go in with a figure and we see who matches that, or do they come and present to us? So this is, um, to, I'll be absolutely honest with you, this has been put into this committee's budget this year. Uh, it's always sat within amenities. Um, so I have nothing to do with the previous tender, but, but can I just say it's slightly, slightly more than just putting them up and take them down. You know, there's there's uh, visits to actually test them before test the bracketing, do do all the uh, the weight testing on them, um, the support in terms of being here um, on the night and for a period after if there's any issues. It does seem to be a lot of money. I'm glad that we've come 364 pounds within budget, so we are still within budget. But uh, uh, but again, hopefully when we go out to so. It's it's delivering the spec. It's you know so again you guys will see the tender spec and agree the tender spec before we go out to tender as you do with all tenders. So thank you. Any more comments on that report, colleagues? Thank you very much. Well, that was uh, six nine nine. We have visited seven hundred already. So moving on to seven oh one, Guildhall Heritage Hub project. Um, about so it says uh, lead community uh, committee officer, but I'm really, really pleased that I'm passing this one over to Kate. <laughs> um, yeah, so I thought, um, so obviously, um, if you don't know, I was employed two and a half years ago to oversee the event side of the Guildhall Heritage Hub and the heritage and education side of it. So when I joined, all the capital works were done. So um, I'll give you a brief overview of what the project was, because obviously, we have a lot of new councillors here who don't know what the project was. Um, so the Guildhall Heritage Project was to develop a successful community heritage hub with an additional tea room, um, a creation of a professional heritage 
display about the famous people relating to the history of the Guild Hall, deliver an education programme and a community engagement activities um, programme, um, inspirational stories about the famous folk from the Thetford Guild Hall, to um, re-envisage the volunteer programme and complete um, and, um, increase capacity with uh, training, educators, researchers, uh, tour guides, exhibitionists, but all on a volunteer basis. Um, professionally, um, conserve the displays in our civic history and our Sikh history and look at the Assizes courts that used to sit in the Guildhall for hundreds of years. And then also the restoration, remodelling and improved access. So all the capital works was done before and during COVID. So that's when we first originally got the bid. So obviously that was the steps outside the entrance, the toilets, putting the kitchen in, developing the tea room. Um, obviously, before we got this bid, the guild hall wasn't really used um, on a regular basis. It was used for council meetings. Um, sometimes there was kind of bric-a-brac sales in there, but it wasn't used like it used to be used in the olden days where it's kind of a hub of the community. And that was the point of this project to make it the hub of the community again. Um, so then we had also in that spec it was a very i mean i've delivered heritage and arts projects for nearly 20 years now so and this one was the most specific one i'd ever seen when i took on the project it was very specific on what we had to deliver um with regards to events and education but this is kind of just a road map of kind of where we got to um i will say as well there is a full extensive report this is just some bits taken out so if anyone would like a copy of it then please let me know and i can forward it to you um but basically we um, had to deliver four big town events, which were a Punjab festival, it was a World War weekend, um, it was a Victorian steampunk weekend, um, and it was a community kind of creative weekend as well that we had to deliver within that project, which we delivered all of those in the last two years. We also had to deliver an education project, which saw us just working with four EMAT schools um, in um, Thetford. Um, that then rocketed um, after that, and we're now working with extensive amount of schools. Um, is that the first slide or the second? Second. Second slide. Go back to the first one. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so the first timeline, obviously, um, I was appointed as heritage officer um, as part of the uh, process. It was part of the budget to employ a heritage and town events officer. Uh, then we delivered the Punjab weekend in September 2021, which was... Um, attended by thousands of people on the marketplace and the newly refurbished steps were full of people, which was lovely. Um, we then, as part of that um, heritage um, kind of package as well, we had to deliver the story of Holmes and Cable, who are some of our, our founders of kind of Australia. It's a beautiful story. If you don't know it, so please come and talk to me about it because it's an epic story and huge for our history of Thetford. Um, the, that play was commissioned and took place on the marketplace, which was part of the project. We opened a tea room in October 2021. Uh, we appointed our education officer. Just after that, we delivered Christmas light switch on. Um, with part of um, part of that was to do with the, the heritage as well, and just have events on the marketplace and within the guild hall. So that's when we kind of really started to move things around with the with the Christmas light switch on to involve the guild hall and the marketplace a little bit more. Uh, in terms of the assizes, so we've done extensive research on the Guildhall um, and we've found some incredible things that have happened in their trials. So we started to recreate those trials as part of this project as well. So people could come in and listen to trials that were said in those exact forms over 200 years ago. Uh, we did six of those and all of them sold out. Um, we did Shadows of Thetford, which I, I kind of touched on earlier. Uh, we had an assizes weekend because Thetford 200 years ago would have been full of people excitedly coming into the town centre to watch some poor unfortunate souls be trialled in the guild hall. Um, so we, as part of the project as well, had to recreate one of those, which we did. Uh, we did the Jubilee, Creative Carnival, Thetford Dungeons, next slide. Did lots of things along this road, another Christmas lights. So we then started guild hall tours, which are still successful. I did one not last Saturday, Saturday before, and it was sold out. Um, so we tour people around the guild hall and tell them all about the, the famous folk that were there. Uh, we had the mosaic restored and repainted within the Guildhall corridor, and we also did a project with the schools that's still ongoing at the moment, <laughs> um, uh, um, which is all paid for by the Heritage Lottery, but still coming to the final stages, um, which the schools have designed mosaics to go in near the toilets of the, of the Guildhall. 
Uh, we did a steampunk event, which was also called Stinky Streets. There's our lovely mayor, Alan Mins, that was based on him, Victorian mayor, who cleaned all of our rivers and cleaned all of our streets. Um, we then had the Singh family tree painted, and we've just got a beautiful tablecloth to go over our large table, all about our history with the Singhs and um, our history with kind of our civic history with Freddie Julep Singh. Um, so that was another thing, World War weekend. We then had another history weekend where we had lots of people come and develop their skills, heritage skills. Um, we had a school celebration because it was coming up to two years um, of doing lots of outreach with the schools. Seaside special, Halloween events, the water trough on the marketplace was finished off to have more, to have clean water back on, um, on, on its site. Doesn't make any sense. In it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just uh, so the project's been hugely successful. Um, obviously, I've just got a few things I just want to highlight. We'll skip through these slides because I know I could act, I could talk for absolutely hours about this project, but I won't. Um, but um, we we are incredibly up on the figures that we should have had. We should have had thirty six thousand visitors on average, but we we didn't. As you can see from this, our growth was huge over over that period. Um, and also, we uh, we trained 42 new volunteers. Um, we had over 52 senior citizens taking part in community craft projects. We've got, we've worked with over 1,500 schools in our outreach projects, and then over uh, in our schools projects, and that's now increased to over 3,000. Um, we have an additional 100 young people that's taken part in our Heritage Heroes scheme, um, and they are ambassadors to their school. And they have lessons with Amber once a week on a Wednesday and they go back and teach it to the rest of their classes. And we have a core volunteer research team of six people who, sh who go and research in Norfolk archive office, like register officers for us and deliver talks and tours with us all voluntarily. Um, skipping on, our education, like I said, has gone uh, out the way, like it's, yeah, it's, it's excelled more than we could. We've got schools from Suffolk. We're now working with every single school, even the upper schools, in um, in Thetford, and we work with schools. We work with um, UEA in Norwich, and we also work with uh, both West Suffolk College and um, the Abigate Six in College. Um, so what worked well, obviously, we exceeded visitor numbers. The tea room was success successful in the picture that the original bid painted of it until obviously foreign scaffolding got put in. Um, the programme of events was really well received. Um, we had a wide range of audiences. I've got all the audience kind of um, surveys and feedback if you ever want to see any of that. We had we have great attendance for our historical tours. We installed all the installations of displays within the tea rooms and the corridors. Um, we had obviously four original schools packs. We've now got six um, and we also do extra outreach work. Um, and we obviously have a group of four strong volunteers and also with our schools project and our our kind of outreach work it's definitely shown people that didn't know about the council what the council does as well especially some of our school trips that kind of when our when our some of our students become councillors we educate the students as much as we educate the teachers there's not one teacher that's come on our tours and our um, schools program knew that you were voluntary everyone thought that you were paid so it's this that kind of it's that education of everybody not just um not just students um so the legacy of the guildhall project is obviously we have a really extensive education and outreach project and that the guildhall has become more than just a heritage hub it's become a community hub we have a community choir we have a community writers group we have a community strings quartet group we have um obviously a group of volunteers that do all of our um, tours and things like that. But we also have grown lots of lots of other community projects outside of that as well. So we had a drag night that started off in the Guild Hall. He's now progressed to doing it in the Carnegie. So um, we've had lots of theatre in there. We've had weddings. We've had so much stuff go on in that building. Um, and the capacity is much bigger than we originally thought with some of the stories and the history that we've found. Um, and yeah, so that's it in a nutshell, but not really because I can speak for ages. 
I'm trying to desperately think of the biggest knot I, I can remember. The sort of thank you very much. For <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we want to can, I, can I just ask you? I, I've got a note here that says um, do, we we aren't going to talk about the rickshaw project or the outdoor PA equipment. I presume there's is there no update on those, or do you want to have a quick update on those at some stage? We, uh, I mean, I can take it in the in the next bit. Okay. After this. Yeah. Well, as okay. long as there's no questions for Katie, I can do that. Um, any any follow up on on uh, what Katie said? Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm being really boring. Um, obviously, the uh, the outcomes and the delivery has been fantastic compared to uh, where things were in the past. Um, as chair of finance, you'd expect me to ask about finances. Mm -hmm. Is there a separate report on budget and how we perform yes. against that? So Just in, about that to ask boring questions. Yeah, like no, in the, so in the main one, it had the financial report in here that me and Alan did, because obviously I have to, so everything has to go to Heritage Lottery. So the Heritage Lottery, I had to do a monthly report, yeah. um, a monthly kind of overall report and a monthly financial report. So I've got all of those that you can see, but it kind of, you can so you've got kind of the tea room saves as well as venue hire as well as events income um over over the kind of two and a half year period so but the headline figure is we were on budget yes and everyone's happy yeah all right thank you thank you very much indeed for that and uh item 702 colleagues is community engagement so uh do you think there's any further media release required or any further consultation or anything that should definitely appear on social media or indeed not? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, it's not as a result of today's specific meeting, but you know when we spoke about the events when we were having a discussion when we first got elected, not being on social media, I keep using the Colford Classic Car Show as my example, driving around the town and even up there. I always know that there's going to be the Culver Classic Car Show. I don't do social media, right? The events that we've had listed up there, so I just think we need to, and not specifically right now, obviously as a result of stuff, I think we need to get across a bit better. To maybe, you know, I, I just use the post office, like yeah. customer service, you know, with their posters up with a list of them in advance and then nearer the time specific to the events, maybe the football clubs, I'm just, yeah, places that people go, I just think we could do a really good and not necessarily expensive job of getting the events known around, not just on a digital format. But I don't know if that's shared in you, it's just mine. Mm -hmm. It makes sense about putting the leaflets of the, of the posters, the strategic places where people usually tend to go and accumulating yeah. numbers to make make the most impact possible. I live in Brandon Road every time I pull up at the traffic lines by the chase. I see. You call me, isn't it? Oh, yeah. we're yeah. classic. Yeah. Oh, I just know it's I, I, I know. Yeah, it's just obvious. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you reported the front. So it's very clear. It works. So firstly, Vic beat me to it on that one. In terms of the only one that has permission to legitimately do that is members of the Showman's Guild, which is the fun fair uh, and the circus. Um, so technically, we can't do that. So if we did that, we would be absolutely crucified. <coughs> we're, we're stopping other people. One thing that we have spoken about, but unfortunately, it costs money, is we need more community poster sites. Although we can use community centres and things like that. And again, if you go to the North Norfolk coast, um, and you go uh, into the uh, the toilets there, they will have those very posters. They will tell you what's coming on right the way through the summer season. Um, so again, you know, I mean, we've got three public toilets that we should have posters sites within them, you know, because people go in there. So, uh, so that's, but we, you know, we talk about the marketplace and we have an, a proper poster site on the marketplace. Uh, so that's somewhere where we definitely uh, need it. Um, and really, we need another one down by uh, King Square. Um, one of the things that I've put down here for community engagement, and it's not going to be uh, tomorrow because we need to uh, flesh out things like sponsorship opportunities, but we don't meet again for another two months. So certainly by then, we need to have um, highlighted the fact that we are offering sponsorship opportunities to those businesses that want to engage with uh, a town council that's very proactive in putting on community and town events. So once we've got that format, we can do that. We have agreed tonight the uh, 2024 uh, events sponsorship programme, so we need to get that out. But with a specific focus again on 
D-Day because that's a big national event and we're going to do so much more. So as long as we give ourselves a few uh, few days just to get all the additional things that we've spoken about um, tonight with some of the councillors actually embedded into that as well, um, we need to we need to uh, tell people that Thetford's going to celebrate D-Day fantastically well. Um, so they're the they're the things that 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 I've got that we can do. Just as a point of clarification, so if you, I'll just use the post office as an example because I've spent probably 15 years of my working life in that building. If you have permission from them, you can't put anything up in the caller's office or, you know, what, any, is, is that required? You know, you get the permission from the manager of that building or whatever it might be. Are you then allowed to do it? And I understand not the traffic lights, I get all that. I'm talking about, you know, where you go to pick up your parcels and a lot of people will use that main central point to pick up your parcels. Seems like an ideal place. We've always advertised businesses free of charge in there. And obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of other examples around the town. Um, for example, and I use the football club as an example, when we were involved in Fetford Town Football Club, we asked Tesco's if we could use some of their land and we put a, I know this is not being used anymore to be fair, but they put a next fixture poster up there. And all we, all we got was permission from Tesco. So are we not in that position or? I don't know. So we had a call from uh, the marketing arm that Tesco is used that are trying to flog us something like a £3,000 sponsorship uh, for putting posters up in their beak. But, but again, both supermarkets uh, have community boards. Uh, the garden centre has community boards. And we are not a commercial organisation and we're doing these events um, free of charge in most cases for the good of the residents. So we need to get back to Tesco, Sainsbury's um, and the Garden Centre and see, because they, they have a huge footfall. I did mean for that rather than sponsorship, by the way. I, did, I wasn't actually contradicting the point you made earlier. I just meant from a community perspective. Mm -hmm. No, everyone's on Facebook. But also someone told Katie and I the other day that, um, you know, they, they put posters up uh, in shops and things. And every time we've gone into shops, the classic answer is that they have to go to head office to get permission. Um, but again, we need to get back round because if if there's been a shift in um, in mindset over that, then again, that's a great opportunity to uh, to advertise. I think the Sainsbury's should do Sainsbury's head office, isn't it? Tesco's isn't it? Sainsbury's. Okay. On, on that note, Lawson, so I've got their key. Yeah, got the key. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, um, and and talking to, to Matt, he's very keen to get involved in, I mean, he'd be one of the options to, to talk to in terms of sponsorship because he's bringing that conversation to the table. He wants to get involved. So he's got a community window there. So, so Jay, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, we've got, we've got. I was just going to say for Adam's benefit, because he's not on venues and communications, but those of us that are, Hazel's pretty good now at bringing a little pack of posters to every meeting. Um, of things that are coming up for council to take away. So I take it away, you know, you know give it to the guys at Charles Burrow and they stick it up there. I wondered if maybe we should roll that out to full council because obviously we're not picking up all 18 councillors, just the eight that are on that committee. But um, what we don't want is staff spending days and days and days trawling around buildings, sticking up posters when there's 18 of us, if we all take a pack of posters, we're all involved in various buildings and groups and stuff. And that's what I do. Um, and if we maybe expand on that further, that will, you know. Yeah. We also work really, uh, and I say this because we've got a, um, they've got a meeting this Thursday, the U3A, which have a big membership. And uh, for the sake of Hazel spending five minutes on um, producing their next month's speaker's poster, um, they also take a pack around all the surrounding villages, all the post offices, the, the little community shops that they deliver their um, their poster of the U3A2. So they take our posters with them. So again, we're building those connections all the time. So hopefully we're getting out there. But you're never gonna you're never gonna get 100% coverage. But we need to strive to that. So any other ideas that people have got, that's absolutely brilliant. Let's hear them. Vic. Vic, I think you were next. No, no, oh, no. Okay. I was just thinking out loud, um, if you are having conversations with companies about sponsorship, perhaps if they decline any financial sponsorship, uh, an option to put a poster up might be the last yeah. part of that conversation. Yeah. 
that's too quick. I've got one, so I'm really sorry. Have we put into the 500 pound grant for Brecon? 300 pound. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, well, we were only able to put in for the match funding and the beacon, but as we're looking at a, a more appropriate beacon, then 300 quid's worth. Oh, brilliant. Sorry. Yeah. Can we move on then to committee officers update? Is there anything from you? The only thing, so, um, and this is doing with complete uh, uh, agreement of the acting town clerk, because unfortunately Carla asked for an agenda item for this meeting, uh, and she did uh, email um, the acting town clerk uh, about it, and he totally forgot to push it through to you and I. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, this is if with your permission, chair. This is maybe an opportunity where Carl can just talk about it. It's, it's talking about uh, what we could do in support of the Portuguese ambassadors. Is, it, is that correct? Yeah, so that's 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 the three points. Um, there's no major decision required. So it, it's a good thing because once it isn't put it in the agenda, it would be awkward to try to make a decision without an agenda and item in it. Um, so yeah, Alan did, did email me and did say, I should apologize, it was just an, over, an oversight and I could always get a chance to put a word in now. Um, so there's three things that we are developing on the background that we just need the council support in principle for those things. One of them is that I already spoke to the mayor with Stuart. Um, we're going to arrange a date that works with him and that works with Pushki's ambassador because on the previous meeting they, they, they had, they agreed he was going to come up and make a visit uh, and go for you know a little tour of Tesford to get to know a little bit of the local area, a little bit of the, the, the history. So we try to organize um, enough a day or so that we have we have a lunch where we have a meal with investors. We can all socialize some network and then perhaps take them to a few crucial locations like the museums, the steam museum, and just have a little tour of Tesford for them to understand what Tesford is all about um, and and a few other points to understand the diversity within the town. So I'm just pending on Stuart State, his availability, so I can match that with the ambassadors. So just, there's just an update on that respect. Um, this is open to all councils, and everybody that wants to join us on that day will, uh, but obviously I'll speak to email about it after. Um, the next one is, we spoke about creating a festival, Pushkis theme, for the cultural, music, food, et cetera, side of things. I like the similar to the Punjab, maybe not as big to start with, because the Punjab has been running for a bit. Um, but something similar, it's just for the festival where people can get together and have a, good, have a good time. We had a difficulty because obviously we already kind of close to spring. Try to organize it for this year might be a bit of a challenge. So we even spoke about maybe try to put this down to the end of the summer. This is something I'm going to bring back to another meeting because I need to figure out with the, with the institutions, including the, the groups that are going to perform, because this will be arranged externally. I'm just looking to let you, to get you guys informed and to get the support of the council. It may be that as a group, we'll put in a little uh, request for a, a small grant to support some of the costs of setting up the, the, the event, but the support will be still as much as this. I'm going to come back to the council for the Riverside licensing and all that stuff. So that's more else organized by a national group together with the, with the Portuguese entities. Uh, but it is for that, but we'll be setting that, so it's just relevant general support for it. Um, the one, there's another point that we spoke about before, is that to be about the, the old twin, we'll call it the Lincoln, the sister towns, was trying to introduce a partnership with the Portuguese town. This is also this was also discussed on the previous meeting between some of the people who went here from the embassy. The embassy is completely on board, they already get the stamp of approval. We're just waiting to, to, to make sure that you know, the council is okay with it and wants to proceed with it. So get your support on that, because I need to be able to get the support before going to the Portuguese authority to another town or city across and make a proposal on their side. They will be receptive uh, because they have this, the best of the support, but I need to make sure that this side is on board as well. There's no point in me trying rolling the ball and trying to organize those, those conversations, how we're going to proceed, what kind of what kind of structure, what kind of plan are we going to have for this type of partnership between towns? Uh, what's going to be in and what's going to be out? If obviously one of the sides is not on board, so I need I need that. That's the only bit that I kind of need the decision on per se. But if it can be pushed on for just full council or another meeting, I'm happy to do so because obviously this was sort of the last minute. <laughs> Um, so if we can, if I can get support in that and put that in the next agenda item to be voted to be to go forward. That would be great. Lastly, 
is um, I mentioned before, I explained in planning to some of the councils who are present about the organizing of the trade show. This is this is the third edition of the Portuguese offer with a major trade show with businesses, business to business, a business to consumer event. The latest one took place in London. We're trying to build, bring it to East Anglia. Initially, we aimed this for 25. It's now been established that it will be in 26. The reason being because it's going to be substantially bigger. Um, I, I, I distribute, so I'm not going to bore you with details because I distributed a little update just so you guys have a, a, a sort of an idea of what negotiations are and which point of the conversations we are at with developing this event. But there are a lot of organizations on board with it, including um, chambers of commerce that will come from Portugal, from their side, who will come to the embassy to sign protocols with, with the, myself, with the group that's organizing this, with the group that's organizing this. So you will come to London to sign those protocols to make sure that the show goes ahead between the entities from here and abroad. And the same is being done on this side. But the details are there, you guys can read a little bit. If there's any questions, just ask me about it later. I'm happy, I'm happy to explain. So what I need is make test of the headquarters the base for it. This, this, this is what I'm personally pushing for. I mean, this is what that's going to go ahead. We are negotiating with the grounds. Could be Norwich, could be Cambridge. We are trying to negotiate the terms. Very small, know where it's going to be based. We still have time. We have two years on the making because it's a large event. That will take a long time. However, the base and the headquarters, I really want to make it invested because if I'm able to produce the organization, produce all the people who are saying, where's the block and such and such test for Norfolk and put it test on the map. Somehow, which is something I can't do because the event itself is not can't be hosted in Tesla. We just don't have the capacity for an event of this size. We can't have the events, but we can have the headquarters here. So I'm gonna put a proposal to the council to support the group, to support the plan, and to you know give me the give me the, the tools and resources necessary to base an office in Tesla. That doesn't mean that the council has to give me an office, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> Uh, I am going to talk to Breakout Council. They do have offices on, on the centre, and perhaps this is something they can we can negotiate having a space there to base this there. What I need is to have the full support of the council to get the logo and the stamp of approval test the council for this before I go back to the embassy to the other entities and tell them this is where it's going to happen. Is a yeah, so where is Tesford and are they on board? And how would we know that? I'm going to need some sort of confirmation in writing. To make sure that the test of some sort of name to it and to the stamp to that stamp into it as well. That's that's summary basically. Sure. Thank you. Anyone want to add to that? I, I I think we 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 can make a recommendation to council to discuss it or to decide Could on I it. If that perhaps that's that's probably the first we'd expect to go in this meeting. Uh, I'm happy to do that, colleagues. So we discussed at, at a full council meeting. It, we can't leave it to our next meeting. It which lives two more months. It is a long time. Um, yeah. So we'll, t we'll put it on the agenda of full council if we can do. This is why I put it well in advance, but unfortunately they forgot to include it. <laughs> so I'm sorry. You know, it was meant to be discussed in advance, but yeah, it is what it is. Okay, thank you. I've got Terry. Uh, just just to say, if, it, if it's going on a future agenda, whether it be for council or a committee, um, can there be some clarity about what we're being asked for? Are we being asked for support in principle? Are we being asked for money? Are we being asked for staff time? What are we voting on? Um, I'm very happy with the principle. I think it sounds lovely. Um, but what does it mean in pound, shilling and pence and commitment? When we have that, we can table a vote. I, I accept that because I think actually there have been a number of items this evening where it's not been absolutely clear whether we're just listening, whether we're taking it forward, whether we're making a specific decision. And I think we do try and we do have to. I think really, that's... strictly speaking, if a decision is going to be made, it should say in the agenda that we are going to make a decision. So we need to be just a bit, bit clearer on, yes. in the way we word some of the agenda items. Other parts I can clarify. Okay. And financial. Um, I'm going to suggest, colleagues, that, that uh, given the time, we yeah. we simply we we could turn it there, but we say we we will put it forward to full council if if you're okay. happy to do that. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm going to push on because we do have a, a below the line item seven oh four exclusion of oppression public. And I'm going to do the traditional read because you have to do it. So there to consider resolving that pursuant to the public body's admission to meetings act 1960, the press and public be excluded. For any remaining item of the business on the grounds that publicity would be prejudicial to the public interest by reason of the confidential nature of the business to be discussed. 
and we have to do so. I'll 